And I actually think as we kind of move towards the end of this sermon series called Descendants, uh, that this, this passage, and God does this so frequently, it's awesome. This passage sits at, at really the perfect place as we kind of move back to Wilsonville. And, and I think part of, part of that is, is that we need, if you're a Christian, if you're part of our church, we together, we need the reminder that this passage is going to give us. Uh, and if you're, if you're not a Christian, then this, this sermon is just, it's for you. It's really important for you. One of the things that's happened to me is, as we have gone through this last year and, and kind of moved back is, uh, I don't know how to say this without making things weird, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do I'm just going to say, I, I have always loved Oregon with my entire heart. And this last year, it's been a difficult place to be. How about that? It's been a really diff, and I don't, I don't, may, I guess by the laughter, I'm not alone. Oh, we kind of all feel that. I mean, uh, I, you know, there's lots of reasons that it's been, a, for me, a difficult place to exist. Uh, but there's been a really good part of that. Uh, and it's this, I, I, it's been easier for me to see myself as a missionary here in, in the state in which I live. Somebody who's here in order to help other people know Jesus. My whole life I've just loved Oregon. And, you know, when you love a place, it's, it's like being on vacation. You don't think about, you know, what's my job here? What am I really doing here? And, uh, and I've always just felt like that about home. My favorite part of traveling has always been coming back to Oregon. And in some ways, I think that sets me at a, at a disadvantage to really see myself as someone who should share Jesus with other people, which, if you're a Christian, you know this, we, we think we should be doing. Like, if you've ever been on a short-term mission trip, <clears throat> excuse me, you know like you leave your state, you leave your country even, and you go somewhere, and it's so easy to be missional, to be focused on sharing your faith with other people because you've actually gone to a place to do that. And when you're at home, that's much harder because you're just, you're just home. You're just living life. You're going to work. You're doing the things that you always do. And, and so I think that partly this sermon falls perfectly because we've now, we've now come back to Wilsonville as a church. I know you've lived at home. And we're now, this is you know, more you know, individual for you. You're starting to see people again, right? And maybe you've taken that for granted in the past. And today we have this wonderful reminder about this incredible job that Jesus has given us to do. And, and it's all within the context of this really big question. Last week, uh, I preached about how <clears throat> we are saved through faith. And it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter if people have tried to live a great life or if people have you know, spent their whole lives doing terrible things. For Paul, the question was Israel. Israel's really worked to have a right relationship with God. And yet so many of them didn't get one. They didn't become Christians. And then, you know, people who just were living for themselves and had totally rejected God, hated, you know, the idea of the Jewish God, they had become Christians and, and it was through faith. And now in our passage today, Paul answers this question that you probably didn't think of. I didn't think of it, but he answers it because a lot of people probably did. Well, why did Israel reject their Messiah? I mean, why did the people who were looking for righteousness, who were trying to earn a relationship with God, why is it that those are the people that missed? And in answering this question, he gives us, he gives us really three options on why people sometimes reject Jesus. They choose not to have faith. And I think that's an important question. Why, why is it that people reject Jesus? Now, there's probably more than three answers to that question, right? But he gives us three here, and they're very important for us to see. Now, last week in, in the passage, I didn't talk on, about this a lot, but he talked about how Jesus was a stumbling stone to a lot of people. And, and I brought this today because, um, because it, it reminds me of a stumbling stone in some ways, and, and specifically because of something that happened. Uh, my son's right over there. You may have heard him yell that the music was too loud just a minute ago, which is funny because I thought 83-year-olds said that and not three-year-olds, but, but my son thought the music was a little too loud today. Uh, and, and my son, last summer, we were working hard to get the church property ready to do church out there. <clears throat> I think most of you were out there with us. Thank you. Uh, and one day when we were working on it, Bryn had gone home and both the kids wanted to stay with me. And it was the end of a long day. There was a lot of long days out on the property this summer. And, and uh, Hudson, he tried to climb into the back of my truck and he slipped because we had been moving gravel. That's what we had spent the day doing, moving gravel into my truck and then out of my truck. And he slipped and he fell 
and he hit his back on a cinder block. And, and Hazel starts screaming, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm not, uh, I could not be an ER nurse. We have an ER nurse in our church. I, it's not me. Um, I'm, I'm going to panic mode. I'm yelling at everybody, get in the car, hospital right now. Everybody's dying, you know. Uh, and I'm, I actually was yelling at my daughter because she, they were supposed to be in the car. And it was just a mess of a thing. And his whole back is just, just, it looked like it got cheese grated by this cinder block. And he wasn't paralyzed, so that was good. There was uh, no long-term damage, but his whole back was just scraped up. And he's screaming for mommy, and I'm screaming for mommy. And uh, I like, we're, we're all on the same page. Everybody, we need Bren. We need Bren. We can't take care of this without Bren. And so, so we got home. He was fine. He still has a little bit of a scar, actually, on his back. Uh, and we'll probably have it forever, but scars are awesome, so whatever. Uh, but but the, this... This and his injury in some ways remind me of a, of a stumbling stone. And I, and I said last week that there are two things that can happen with Jesus. Either, either Jesus in, in your life becomes a key centerpiece, a building block. In fact, the, the, the block that you build your life on, you come to build your entire life on the rock. Or he becomes this stone that you just slam your shin in to over and over and over again. And, and, and why, why is it that some people choose to build their life upon the rock and other people just slam their shin into it? And, and this is what Paul's gonna answer for us today. And here's what it says in Romans 10, 11 through 13. The scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Paul basically says the same thing three different times with some cool and I think uh, really important nuances. But the overall point here that Paul is trying to make is quite simply, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile, uh, there's only one way to salvation. And this is what we talked about last week. He is, in some ways, just summarizing the passage of Scripture that I preached on last week. And he's saying, it doesn't matter who you are, where you've come from, what race, nationality, how sinful or not sinful you've been, if you've been to prison or you haven't, if you used to be an addict or you're, you've lived clean your whole life. I mean, these things are not important questions. The only question is whether or not you call on the Lord, whether you place your belief in Jesus. Now, important pause, gospel story, the story that we believe, the story that Paul has shared all the way through the book of Romans, right up until this point, he has been talking about this gospel story, and that's the story that all people are sinners, we've all done bad things, and Jesus came from heaven to earth to die for those sins. He came back to life, conquering both sin and death on our behalf. And now, if we choose to believe in him, if we choose to place our faith in him, if we give Jesus our lives, then our sin is forgiven and we are, this is the word Paul uses, we become righteous. And righteous is just a fancy way of saying innocent. And so by placing our faith in Jesus, we go from guilty to innocent. We go from a broken relationship to God to a fixed relationship with God. That's an incredible story. And Paul says here, just again, None of it, none of your history, none of your baggage, none of your background, none of that matters. The only thing that matters is whether or not you believe in Jesus and and you call on, we're going to come back to this, whether you call on the name of the Lord. Now, belief in the Bible, maybe you've heard me say this, maybe you've heard somebody else say this, it's not just like a mental, you know, confirmation that something is true. James 2.19 says, you believe there's one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. And I've made the claim before that, that the demons are probably more sure that Satan and the dark forces that exist in the world are probably more sure of the gospel story than I am, that that is true. So, so that's not the idea. The idea is really uh, committing our lives to Jesus. And I, I got a perfect um, illustration of this, I thought, the other day. Uh, we watched the movie, the BFG, the Big Friendly Giant. You're maybe if you're a Roald Dahl fan, like I was as a kid, and uh, and it, you know one of his books. And the BFG is about a, a big <clears throat> friendly giant, as you may have guessed. And he connects to this little girl, and this little girl loves him. But he realizes because he lives in in giant land, and they're all scary. My kids could tell you their names, like child chewer and uh, very scary names. Uh, and, and so he realizes they're going to eat this little girl. So he takes her back to the orphanage 
which she had, he had taken her from in the first place. And, and she doesn't like it. She wants to go live with him. She, she, he's become like a dad-like figure in her life. And she goes out to the window in, her, in the movie version of, of this, and, and she knows that he has incredible hearing. He can basically hear anything. And she stands outside of her window on the little ledge, and she says quietly, I know you can hear everything. And so I know that you can hear me. I'm going to jump and you're going to have to save me. And then she jumps. And then his hands come flying in and just catch her immediately like that. And I thought, because I'm a pastor, wow, what a beautiful picture of, of what it means to truly place our faith in Jesus. It isn't just that we go, oh, I think you can hear me and all that. It's that we, we just jump into a relationship with him. We commit our lives to him. We say, you're the one that's going to save me. You are the one who can save me. And we allow him to do that. And, and then, you know, Paul moves from there and he moves into, it goes right with the second description. That illustration is perfect for the second description of what it means to have faith. And he says that we call on the name of the Lord. It's three times he says this uh, in different ways. And verses 12 through 13. It's a quote from Joel 2.32 in the Bible. The the history of calling is, you know, you can see it throughout. People stop and they call on the name of the Lord. They call on the power of God to come and and help them. And often it's in a liturgical setting. A bunch of, you know, Israelites get together and they seek the Lord together. They call on the name of the Lord. But it really expresses two things that are so important and, and so different than just I kind of believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world. If you you were to study calling on God in the Bible, you would see kind of these two ideas come forward. The first is that it expresses a prayer for deliverance. Like, we're going to war, so we're going to call on God to save us. And the second is it expresses worship. Like, we believe that you are more important, you're better, you are holy, we are not, you are God. It is honoring to God, it is worship. And, and here's, man, this is so important, especially, and I, I think I say this like every other sermon, but I'm just blown away by the percentage of people that call themselves Christians in our society, given my Facebook feed and how negative people are towards Christianity. Like something's not aligning, right? Like in the numbers we see and then how the majority of people view Christians, something's off. And I think what's off is that most people think that Christianity, being a Christian, being a Jesus follower, is simply mentally affirming something to be true rather than jumping off the ledge and committing your entire life to God as you call on him in both worship and for deliverance. I think people go, yeah, I kind of think Christianity is probably more accurate than you know another religion, pick another religion. But being a Christian, being somebody who is all the things that Paul describes here, saved and richly blessed, This is us committing ourselves to Jesus because we believe that he is the one to be worshipped and he is the only one who can save. This is the language Paul, uh, not Paul, sorry, Peter, uh, in the very first like Christian sermon, he he says that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And interestingly, in Acts 9.21, I I actually like this, uh, when it's describing Christians, when it's talking about what it is to be a Christian, it doesn't use the word Christian in Acts 9.21. It says those who call on this name. That's how Christians were described, those who call on the name of Jesus in worship and for deliverance. I think that Christian has been so tainted that it would be helpful for us to say like, you know, more, not are you a Christian, but like, have you called on the name of the Lord in worship and for deliverance from your sins? Now, again, Paul says that some groups have done it and some groups haven't. And what's the why? Why? And we're going to talk about that in a second. But before I look at that, I want to say one more thing. There's three things here that he lists that are so good about being somebody who's called on the name of the Lord. He says there is no shame. Wow. Wow. Like what I think that's like that's such a good reason just to be a Christian, right? Like we can have no shame. And man, I, I this is another thing I say a lot because we have a church that holds on to guilt. We have a lot of people in our church that just hold on to guilt. And so I feel the need to kind of beat this same drum over and over and over again. There is no reason to be 
living in shame once Jesus has forgiven you of your sins. Now, I think guilt plays an important role in our lives. I can say it's played an important role in my life, and that important role is it stops me from doing certain things that I know I shouldn't be doing. And so then when I'm past them, there's just no reason to sit around and be living in shame for the things that you have already left behind because you have been fixed, you have been made right in Jesus. And so there is no shame because Christ has taken away our shame. He was shamed on a cross in order that we no longer have to be living in shame. There is no shame for Christians. And it says that God richly blesses those who call on his name. I mean, this means we have provision, like God will take care of our needs. We have hope, we have peace, we have love, we have forgiveness, we have unity. We have all these very Christian words, right, that I think we undervalue if we are Christians because we long for these things inherently as humans. We want to have peace and we want love and we want joy and we want to be in relationship with people that goes beyond our cultural differences and all of that. And in Christ, we find those things. Those who call on the name of the Lord are richly blessed and it's so easy to forget about that in fact what we often just focus on is the last one it's very important too but salvation and and we minimize salvation and you know our relationship with God we minimize and we just make it about getting into heaven someday but God right now takes away your shame if you will call on his name and he not only takes away your shame he richly blesses you and then he saves you from eternal condemnation. That's a really good deal. And all you have to do is place your faith in Jesus. All you have to do is place your faith in Jesus. Now, again, to me this begs this question. Why are so so many people so quick to just reject Jesus. I mean, what, here's what I'm telling you. This is what I'm telling you. This is what the Bible says, I believe. It says, hey, you're a sinner. Everybody agrees with that. And Jesus came and he died for your sins. So if you just give him your life, then you get to be shame-free and you get to be richly blessed and you look forward to an eternity and, you know, perfection. Like, picture the world without any problems and just all the good stuff. That's, that's, that's a really good deal. You don't have to do a single thing except believe this. Now, you would think, right, like, I would think, I would think that almost every person who hears that would say, wow, I'm going to look into that. I'm going to, you know, even if I'm not sure right now, like, I absolutely want that to be true. I want to know that I can build, you know, my life on the rock. I want to know that I can be richly blessed and my shame can be taken away and I don't have to worry about what happens when I die. But is that the response that you usually see from people? Most people want to reject first and maybe think about it later. Most people, hearing that story, the gospel, immediately the walls go up and they're like, no, 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 I don't want any part of that. You just, I mean, come on, just say the name Jesus to somebody outside of the context of stubbing your toe. And people get really uncomfortable really fast. Why? Why? That's what Paul's going to answer for us. But first, he kind of gives us a parenthetical that's so important because it connects to one of the reasons. Here's what he says in verses 14 and 15. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Last week I talked about how Paul's heart and prayer was to see more Israelite people saved. And what Paul hits on here is that it's really important for us, and I said this in my sermon last week, but it needs to be repeated. It's really important for us to feel the same. We should be desperate to see people believe in Jesus and call upon the name of the Lord. And what Paul says here is, you know, probably first about the apostles, like, People can't believe unless they've heard, right? People won't call on the name of the Lord unless they believe, and people won't believe unless they've heard. And then he says, people, you know, have to be sent in order for people to hear. But man, in Matthew 28, 19, 20, one of the more famous, you know, two verses in the Bible says, therefore and go, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. 
You know what this tells me? All of us have been sent to proclaim the story of Jesus to other people. And Paul says, shows us, and he's going to talk about this in just a second more clearly. One of the reasons that somebody might not put their life on Jesus, one of the reasons that people might not call upon the name of the Lord is because they've never heard the story of the gospel. Now, let me say, I've been a Christian a long time, and, and there's been this shift. I think when I was growing up, most Christians assumed that everybody in America had heard the story of Jesus dying for their sins. And I think we were pretty much right when I was growing up. That's just not true anymore. I think that the average person that you live by, that you know, that you go to school with, that you work with, I think the average person, they know some things about Christianity, but they don't know that Jesus, they don't know that we believe that Jesus came so that they might be richly blessed and have no shame and have eternal life. And he did that through what we believe, dying on a cross for our sins. I don't think most people know that story anymore. And one of the reasons that Paul is giving us for people not calling upon the name of the Lord is they simply haven't heard the story of Jesus. How can they call on the one whom they have not heard about? And it is our job. We have been sent. We are here, whether in our state, whether coming back to Wilsonville, whether in our homes, whether going to work, we have been sent to tell other people about Jesus. Let me tell you two stories. One's not a story, but let me tell you a story and a half. Uh, one is just about me. And, and I've kind of grown up, you know, I think I came out of a church where there was this idea of what we would have called friendship evangelism. And, and what that means is that you, you really work hard to become friends with people in order that someday you can tell them about Jesus. There's some merit to this idea, right? Like you, you live long enough with a person, eventually they're going to hopefully ask you about the hope that you have and, you know, why you deal with trials differently why you've dealt with a pandemic differently than other people, how you can, you know, be secure and not be worried. They're going to ask you that eventually, but, but I'm, I'm really, and I'm not, I'm not a good evangelist. Let me just say that. I'm, I, it's just I want to be. I want to tell more people about Jesus. And one of the excuses, I think, inside of me, not vocally, but inside of me, that I make for not being a great sharer of the story of Jesus in a one-on-one -on -one setting with the people that I love is that I'm just being their friend, and eventually the opportunity will come up. But as I get older, I've found that friendship evangelism is very similar to being in the friend zone when it comes to romantic relationships. Do you know this phrase, the friend zone? Like, it's where, where you've gone past the point of being able to ask somebody out because now you know, the girl, in my case, she's already declared, oh, you're such a good friend. Let me talk to you about the boys in my life. And now, like, what are you going to, it's over. Like, it's over. One of my favorite songs right now, it's always going to be a country song. If I ever say that, you know a country song is coming. Hazel and I love singing it at the top of our lungs. It's called Marry Me. Uh, oh, it's so good. Thomas Rhett, if you, uh, you, I shouldn't be recommending it. It says whiskey. But, um, but I, I love this song, and uh, it, it's so good. And, and it's about this guy going to this girl's wedding, and she wants to get married, but she don't want to marry me. Uh, and there's this, this thing in it where he says, we've been friends for forever, and there was this night when I almost kissed her, but I chickened out. I chickened out because he had too much to lose. He knew that the relationship was hanging the balance and if he got rejected, there's no going back from trying to kiss a girl uh, that's your friend, it's over. And this is, this is what I think happens with friendship evangelism. We become such good friends with people in hopes of someday talking to them about something spiritual that eventually we get to the point where we know that we're gonna ruin a friendship if we start to talk about spiritual things and so we never do. We get in the friend zone and we get absolutely stuck there. I don't have great solutions. I don't have like an evangelism plan, but I think we need to go back to the late 80s in some ways and just lead with something spiritual at least. We need to lead with conversations about church. We at least need to let people know where we're coming from. We need to lead with like something that moves the conversation towards spiritual things. So at least then if they choose to be our friends after knowing we're one of the weird Christians, at least then we're all on the same page and I don't have to get 10 years down the line and still be thinking, well, I'm going to ruin our friendship if I talk about Jesus today. We've turned friendship into evangelism, into the friend zone, and we never move past it because we get so deep into these friendships that we forget 
or we get scared to ever share Jesus at all. And I, for one, want to move past that. I, I mean, I mean that personally. I don't mean I want you to move past it. I want to just do better at making the beginning conversations that I have at least salty, to use a biblical word. I want to make them important, and I want to make them spiritual. The other story I've told in a sermon once before, and that's uh, we were in Las Vegas. I was in Las Vegas longer than anybody should ever be in Las Vegas. Um, uh, my wife was doing work down there, and I went with her, and uh, and so I was in Vegas for a week um, with nothing to do because I wasn't going to spend a bunch of money while Bryn was working. It felt weird. Hey, babe, I went to four shows today while you were moving around RV parts or whatever she was doing with her graphic design job. Uh, and and so I wasn't I wasn't going to do that. So I just I wandered around Vegas just. I don't know, seeing the grossness and uh, all of that. For I watched a lot of circuses at Circus Ole. Um, and there's these two things that stood out so clearly to me where people were trying to share Jesus. Uh, one was, I think it was a hard rock cafe right by the Hershey's uh, factory. It's just like a Hershey's store. That one made me mad. I thought it was going to be like a Hershey's factory. Don't get sold on the brochure or whatever but um and this guy was on a megaphone you've seen this maybe at an Oregon Duck football game that's where I've seen it a lot a guy on a megaphone yelling at people about how they're going to hell used to be a guy that stood outside of Wilsonville High School doing it to kids every day they'd come right out tell them about how they're going to hell uh just as loudly and clear and I thought what an idiot you know you're making my job harder and then another night on this trip I uh uh, my wife sends me she says you got to go see this this place. I think it's Fremont Street. Uh, you got to go check it out. They got this video thing on top of your head. It's like the whole ceiling is a video thing. And Bon Jovi was playing. That's the only thing I can, I, all I think about when I think about that song. Um, it's your life, it's now or never, whatever that song's called. Um, but I go there and, and Brent, basically, my own wife, has sent me into everything that we think negative about Vegas is all here now, one spot. I'm like, what did my wife just sent me to look at half-dressed women? Like, what's, now, here's what happened, I think. Bryn being less visually, you know, driven than me, she had gone there and seen a video board. Me, I just saw a bunch of women that didn't have very many clothes on. And, and so I'm like, I gotta get out of here, like immediately. I had to find a bathroom, though. I had driven a little ways. So I found a bathroom and I left. But in my walk to the bathroom and back, I saw a couple of things that have impacted me forever. One was a woman who was wearing a diaper and barely anything else and a man standing next to her. And you could just tell that he was making her stand there and ask for money. And it was so sad. And I thought, and I still think, I pray for this woman. There's only one hope here for this woman. It's Jesus. Like, there's no other way that that this shame goes away. This is it. And a little while later, maybe before, I see this guy, and he's standing there completely quietly. He's from a church, and he's handing out tracts. If you don't know what a tract is, it used to be these things that we handed out, sometimes in the Christian home at Halloween. We'd give them right next to the candy. Kids probably threw them in the trash. And it seemed so outdated, you know, like nobody reads these things anymore. They're throwing them away. But considering everything I was surrounded by, I was like, I think I gave him a thumbs up or something on the way. Yeah, go get him, buddy, like that. And I walked on, got out of there, um, listening to Bon Jovi as I walked. And not long after that, um, the shooting happened in Vegas. Remember that shooting in Vegas? Lots of people lost their lives. And through the years, I've been weirdly convicted about how One guy, I thought he was being a jerk and making my job harder, shouting through the megaphone. And the other guy, I thought, well, what a waste of time. You know, it's nice of you to come down here and hand out your tracks. What a waste of time. (laughs) But I didn't tell any of the people who were maybe going to get shot about Jesus. And they were at least making an effort. And I think we can be really quick to judge the methods of other people and we never give people the opportunity to hear so that they might believe, so that they might call on the name of the Lord. I'm not a proponent of yelling at people in megaphones. I don't think tracks are super effective. But we should be trying to make sure that the people we love know the story of Jesus. We should be trying. And then he gets to the part about why people reject Romans 10, 16 to 21, but not all the Israelites accepted the good news. 
Not all the people we love are going to accept the good news either. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. But I ask, did they not hear? Reason number one, did the Israelites not hear? Of course they did. Their voice has gone out into all the world. Their words to the ends of the world. Again, I ask, did Israel not understand? Reason number two. First, Moses said, I will make you envious by those who are not a nation. I will make you angry by a nation that is not, has no understanding. And Isaiah boldly says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. But concerning Israel, he says, all day long, I have held out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. Here's the three reasons that people have not called upon the name of the Lord. One, some people have not heard. I think we've covered that pretty fully. We need to tell them. Two, he says, do they not understand? Now, this is important, right? This is really important. Because for the Israelites, he says, absolutely, they understood. But there may be people in our lives who just don't understand. I I try to, one of the reasons that I preach every week, and I just try to make it so clear what we believe, is that a lot of people, I think, they just don't understand what we're really saying as Christians. And one of our jobs, for those of us who are Christians, might just be to just help people understand. And man, Matt did a a Bible study recently. Um, Matt, who's over there, on apologetics for the 21st century. And he talks so much about being willing to answer people's questions and and being willing to say, hey, I can find answers if if I don't know them. And I think, well, we could just do that, right? What if we could just say, what if we could just ask, hey, is there anything you don't understand about Christianity? That doesn't take too much guts, right? Like, that's not a giant step. We're not hurting the friends, you know, ship like that. We're not, ter- what if we could just ask that question? Is there anything you don't understand about what I believe as a Christian? And then we could just do it. We, now you go, well, I'm not going to have the answers, you know. Fine, just Google it. Call me, you know. Like, I mean, like we can find the answers to these questions. We have information all around us. So don't worry about not having the answers, but, but maybe you could just find it in you to help somebody understand. I think of this story. Um, where, where a guy named Philip, one of the early uh, apostles, you know, he, it wasn't the gospel the guy didn't understand, but the guy's reading Isaiah 53, which is all about what Jesus did for us. And, and Philip's whole job, this guy was just ready to commit to the Lord. And all Philip had to do was show up by the power of the Holy Spirit and just, just explain to him, like, hey, I'm going to explain what you're reading to you. And the guy just got baptized immediately. And what if we could just answer people's questions to the best of our ability? Man, at least we're taking a step there. And then Paul gives the reason the Israelites didn't believe. And this, this is, I think, the reason for most people why they're going to turn the rock that we can build our lives on into the thing that we stub our shins on, our toes on. And, and that is, plain and simply, they were stubborn. They were stubborn. This is going to be a reality, right? Like, not every person you tell about Jesus is going to accept Jesus. Lots of people are going to be stubborn. Now, one of the things we've got to guard against is looking at stubborn people as stupid people. Because Paul's covered in great detail here that there's no difference. There's faith and there's not faith. Now, they're wrong, and we should love them and care about the fact that they're wrong. But it doesn't mean that they're inherently worse than us because at some point we were the stubborn people. And all that changed is that we at some point decided to be not stubborn anymore. The difference between most people who, who make Jesus the, the rock that they build their lives on and, and those who just run into that rock and reject it without even thinking, reject him without even thinking, push back, find every excuse to not become a Christian is that at some point those who placed their faith in Jesus simply said I'm going to stop being stubborn because in our stubbornness right we want to we want to do so many things we want to say no I'm not a sinner we want to just even though we know somewhere inside of us we've done things wrong it's like I'm not a sinner there's nothing wrong with me there's no reason I deserve to be separated from God and we just build up these walls that that you know just almost don't allow us to accept the salvation that Jesus has offered. It's stubbornness. When we, look at it, you may not remember this. I was four years old when I first committed my life to Jesus. I don't remember being stubborn before that, but, but until the point where we accept Jesus, we are. We say, I can work my way into eternal life. I can work my way into a right relationship with God. And, and until we place our faith in Jesus, we're just saying, no, 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 no. I'm right, I'm right, I'm right, I'm right. And you know, the moment of salvation is really a moment of putting down our stubbornness, 
uh, and our disobedience, as it says here, and saying, I get it. I can't earn it. I don't deserve it. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. Now, what I love is even in the midst of this statement, why did the Israelites not believe? Why do so many of the Israelites not believe? Well, they heard. They understood. Because they're being stubborn. And even in the midst of, of this statement about their stubbornness, listen to how it describes our God. All day long, he holds out his hands to people, even those who are disobedient and obstinate, even those who are stubborn, so stubborn that they're just slamming into him again and again and again instead of accepting it. What a picture of God. Just open arms, looking at you, looking at those that you love, that you want to see except Jesus. He, he just has his arms open to them. And, and like uh, what I read, this is like a term of for family. Like, you know, you can picture your mom or your dad just opening their arms to you and inviting you in. It's not this, right? We all know, we know that that's not good. Don't ever do this when you're communicating with somebody. It makes them feel like you're not listening and you don't care. It's this. It's I am wide open to you. All you have to do is choose to stop being stubborn and accept me as your savior. Even in the midst of their stubbornness and their disobedience, we see this incredible picture of the gracious God that we serve who has his hands out to them, just inviting them in all day long to just place their faith in him, to build their lives on him and to be saved, to have no more shame and to be richly blessed. That is an incredibly beautiful picture of the God that we serve. I know this, man, I know this feeling because like, I mean, my kids do things they're not supposed to do, right? And then they get hurt. This happens all the time. Every kid did it. I did it. We did it. You know, I'm scar right here. I was climbing on furniture when I was a kid. I'm sure I wasn't supposed to be. I fell asleep in my face. And, And we know what a loving parent does, even when their children are doing the things that they're not supposed to do. When their kid gets hurt, when something gets broken, they stick their arms out and they still say, come to me and I will help you. If you're not a Christian, God has his arms out to you and he is inviting you to be fixed, to be healed, to be saved. He wants to take away your pain and your shame and he wants to take away the condemnation that you deserve You've heard it now. (laughs) If you don't understand it, go ask somebody. And if you do understand it, choose to let down your stubbornness. Choose to leave behind your disobedience and give Jesus your life. Those of us that are Christians, man, I mean, what are we doing here, right? I mean, why is it important that our church gets back to Wilsonville? (laughs) Well, uh, It's because we have a job to do to make sure that people hear and understand and then we give them the opportunity uh, to believe. They can be stubborn. They may not accept. My goodness, Paul is getting rocks thrown at him literally because he's trying to tell people about Jesus and make sure they've heard and understand. But we have an obligation to help people hear and to help people understand. And I really hope, man, one of the things I want to grow in as a church in this next season is this, that we'll just tell more people about Jesus. I say it every week, so at least you can just invite people to church. I'll tell them. I'll tell them about Jesus every week. I do it every week because I know that when you invite somebody here, it's a big deal, and it's you might be in the friend zone, and, uh, and you've left it behind. You've taken a chance, and they come here, and I'm going to make sure that they hear, and hopefully they understand, depending on how good my sermon is. But, but So do that. Invite them here, but don't just do that. Because they don't know me. They don't, I mean, who am I? Tell them about Jesus and do their best to help, do your best to help them understand. Here's, here's the deal. Jesus came for everyone and his grace is for anyone. And, uh, and, and we just need to tell people about it. And you need to let down your stubbornness if you're not a Christian and believe it.